Welcome back to In Every Season Advent. I hope you've been following along as we've examined the importance of the first advent when Jesus first appeared to demonstrate God's power and his presence as he fulfilled his promise of salvation to anyone ready to believe. Now, this series is an intense dive into the historical context in which Jesus arrives, and it's crucial to understand these things so that we can live in the hope that this season brings, not just for this life, but also for eternity. Today, we will purpose to devote ourselves to the present Savior by looking at what's known as the silent years, or the intertestamental period. It's those years between the Old Testament and the New. It's said that if you go to the last page of the book of Malachi, which is the final book in the Old Testament, and flip the page to the first book of the New Testament, which is Matthew, you have just achieved the bulkiest page turn there is because you just flipped through about 400 years. Now, there are a little over four centuries of world history between the Old and New Testaments. This period is known as the Silent Years, an era in which God has seemingly ceased to speak, at least in the capacity he did in the Testaments, or when those were forged. Now, to understand this period, I need you to go with me down a bit of a rabbit trail. I want to start with a letter written to the editor of a newspaper in New York called The Sun, way back in 1897. The letter to the editor read like this. Dear editor, I'm eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says if you see it in the sun, it is so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Sincerely, Virginia O'Hanlon. Now, O'Hanlon's father did not believe the son would have time to respond to such an insignificant plea. But unbeknownst to Mr. O'Hanlon, editor-in-chief Edward Mitchell assigned the letter to a copy editor, Francis Farcellus Church who was reluctant to respond at first, but then eventually penned one of the most famous 416-word editorials in modern journalism. His response was published anonymously in The Sun on September 21, 1897, and he begins his response like this, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they see. They think nothing could be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds are little. A little later, he declared, Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary this world would be if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith, no poetry, romance to make tolerable this existence. As if to be spurred on and like he's getting riled up, church continues. Not believe in Santa Claus. You might as well stop believing at all. You might get your papa to hire men to watch all of the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Church continues. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that have ever lived, could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus? Church said incredulously. Thank God he lives forever. Now, I recall that extraordinary editorial not to get you riled up about whether you believe in Santa or if he's real or if he just like being wrong, but I digress. Now, you get the sense that Francis Church was speaking of something far more significant than Santa. When he instructs his readers that there is a veil that is covering the unseen world, Church is enticing something that exists in us all. Some might say that he is trying to spark that part of the image of God that not only seeks to believe, but actually desires to hope in something beyond what we can see and observe. It's hard though, isn't it? At least sometimes. Doubt creeps in all cracks and we place trust in far inferior things. Things like our own eyes, which are seldom to be trusted. They too often only see what we want them to see. Our eyes tend to follow our sin-stained hearts. Yet some moments and experiences bring us to desperation. Many of us have been in that place where we cry, Where are you, God? 
Now that's where many were in those four centuries between Malachi and Matthew. Many mistook God's silence for God's absence. For it is when he is quiet that he's often the nearest. This intertestamental period was a significant source of study about 75 years ago. It was a huge trend to study this period starting in 1949. Why 1949? Well, that's when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And all of a sudden, there became an ocean of material from this 400-year period. Raymond Serberg was one of the leading scholars of this time, and he points out the importance of the silent years. Serberg shows how the development of the civilized world brought about the New Testament period in perfect harmony with what was prophesied in the Old Testament. For instance, the book of Daniel provides incredible insight into all of this. In Daniel chapter 2, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar is troubled by a dream he has of a statue that exists in four sections. In Daniel 2, 32 and 33, we read this. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Daniel, whose Babylonian name is Belshazzar, is called on to interpret what the king has seen. Now bear with me as we read what Daniel reports in verses 38 through 45. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all things. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so shall the kingdom be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. So what's the point here? Well, most believe this prophetic vision showed what was to happen in the world. The top part of the statue represented the Babylonian kingdom, where Daniel was a prisoner. Soon, Babylon was overtaken by the Medo-Persian Empire in a rather surprising way. This was the empirical rule at the end of Daniel's letter, the empire which freed the Jews from captivity to go back to Jerusalem. The kingdom of bronze represented the Greek empire that came into being at the conquest of Alexander the Great. He died at a young age, though, and chaos ensued for nearly 400 years, the very same time period as our silent years. Yet in those years between the epochs of the Old and New Testaments, and during the Greek Empire's rule, the world expanded to the West, and Asia and Europe increased. New cities with Greek names arose in Palestine, and the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, the familiar universal language of the day. This is when the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes showed up, and the Sanhedrin came into being. Synagogues, which were so prominent in their role in the early church, had their origin in the silent years. And many Jewish writings were published during this time, dealing with literary, historical, and religious importance. It was during this time that God prepared the world for what the Apostle Paul calls the fullness of the time, fertilizing the grounds for the arrival of the Messiah. It was near the end of those 400 years when a tiny, no-name Roman Empire began to gain prominence and became the fourth kingdom of iron and clay. But it didn't make sense. They were winning battles against great odds and achieving significant influence in ways that the other nations couldn't fully grasp. Yet when we look back on God's word and God's work, it makes all the sense in the world. You see, during those silent years, God was working wonders that could not be imagined or conceived behind the veil covering the unseeable world. The stone that was cut out by no human hand had certainly struck the image in Daniel 2.34, and God certainly broke into pieces all these kingdoms and brought them to an end and it shall stand forever. Jesus' advent, his arrival, was not just amid a silent night, but it ended the silent years as God revealed himself to us and beckoned each one. 
His precious Christmas gift is himself, and he could not have come at a more perfect time. So if you're in a rough spot, this Christmas is for you. If you're struggling, God is present. If it seems dark and hopeless, know that the first Noel signals the eternal God meeting us in our most desperate time of need. In a season where fear and doubt stand fiercely, Jesus' love relentlessly abounds for all his people, and that includes you, and it is certainly not just for this season, but in every season. If you don't have a church to attend for Christmas Eve, we want to invite you to Christmas Eve with South Rock Christian Church here in Derby. We will have Christmas Eve services this Sunday at 1.30, 3, 5, and 6.30. But until then, be blessed.